Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part three, I believe, of our Lenten Forum series, taking a look at the Eisenheim altarpiece. I think I got it that time. It's both ways, Damon. <laughs> they say it both ways. <laughs> uh, Eisenheim Isenheim altarpiece, and some of the, the characters depicted in it. Uh, Dan, Dr. Dan Deffenbaugh joining us again to lead us through the series. Uh, today uh, happens to be at First Pres Gifts of Women Sunday, where we honor the gifts of women in our congregation and our family of faith. And coincidentally enough, uh, Dan is going to take a look at Mary Magdalene this morning. So, uh, Dan, take it away. Well, just, Damon, just so the women here are clear that you're not casting aspersions <laughs> on their womanhood, womanhood, Mary Magdalene is the patron saint of women among patron saint of, uh, uh, of many other uh, types of people I will, we'll take a look at today. But uh, um, we're looking now at the, the Eisenheim altar piece. And last week, just so we're clear, uh, remember we're, the, this altar piece was painted for theological reasons and not for historical reasons. It's uh, we in the 21st century are the ones who are the most um, you know, concerned and, and uh, meticulous about historical uh, facts. You know, we, we equate fact and truth. Uh, but in the 16th, early 16th century, probably around 1512, when this was painted, uh, facts just didn't enter into the equation. In fact, <laughs> no pun intended, in fact, there really probably was not even a concept of fact uh, at that time. Uh, there was an element of, of belief and uh, in, in just about every I'll say epistemological aspect or the way we know the world, right? Uh, it's the rise of science that we've become so concerned with facts. And this is not a factual uh, representation of what happened uh, at the crucifixion. If we can uh, identify a point in history when the crucifixion of, of Christ actually happened, we, we don't really have historical facts about that. So one of the things that we uh, talked about last week is the presence of John the Baptist. Now, Pastor Greg was kind of concerned, I think, when he said, wait, wait a minute, John the Baptist? Is that the, <laughs> is that the crucifixion? That's not accurate. And of course, John the Baptist would have been, you know, uh, dead by this time. You might remember the story of, of John having his, uh, his head removed after the dance of Salome before Herod Antipas. Uh, as depicted here by this Gozzoli uh, fresco, I believe, John the Baptist on the far left getting his head uh, taken off. Uh, and of course, he's got the nimbus around him demonstrating that he's a saint. And of course, nobody else in this whole picture is. Here's Salome bringing the head of John the Baptist and Salome dancing for his, her father's uh, uh, party. Uh, the story goes that Herod was somewhat reluctant to do this, but he didn't want to go back on his word. And so he, he uh, relented and gave the head of John the Baptist to Herodias, his wife, who wasn't very happy with John the Baptist because John was, you know, getting upset or really pointing them out as sinners defying uh, the Jewish law, Herod marrying his brother's wife, Herodias. Um, not, not a good thing to do. Uh, when you're up against a, a, you know, a tetrarch, a ruler, a king, who has a pretty fragile ego. Of course, you know, in the 21st century, we don't know anything about rulers or leaders or kings with fragile egos uh, and the, the havoc they can wreak. Uh, but today, we're, so we just so we're clear, John the Baptist was not present there, but his presence in this has theological significance in that he is the one as his finger pointing in the, uh, 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 in the image shows that, that points to Christ. He's the bridge between the Old Testament prophets and the Messiah. The, the prophets were always looking for the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist in his day, some believed that he was the Messiah, but, but scripture, the New Testament, goes to great lengths to point out that John believes that Jesus was the Messiah and he was not worthy 
uh, to untie even his sandals or to touch the lace of his sandals. And uh, as the, the little inscription here reads, he must increase and I must decrease. So here's John holding the prophets. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the lamb's blood spilling into the chalice. And you have a good sense of the, the theological uh, motif that's being represented here. Well, today we're gonna look at the left side of the painting. Uh, just to give you a sense of where we're going, here's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, typically in medieval paintings, in the Renaissance paintings, Mary is going to be dressed in blue. But here she's dressed in white, you know, perfectly acceptable, uh, you know, this, the, the color of purity. But the reason she's dressed like this is because this was what the habit looked like uh, in um, uh, the... Uh, Oh, that, I, the monastery where, where uh, this altarpiece uh, hung. So the women there, the religious there were uh, at once uh, hospitalers is what they were referred to. They were, um, you know, at once uh, nuns as well as, you know, nurses. Uh, this is where we actually, it's so ironic that we have for-profit healthcare these days because throughout our history in the West, uh, Healthcare has always been a nonprofit uh, type of um, uh, institution delivered delivered by the church. You know, the hospital is where you deliver hospitality. Well, the hospitality at uh, uh, the the cloister here was was certainly uh, given in grace because of the people that they dealt with uh, suffering from. Uh, St. Anthony's fire, uh, this, this disease that would, that racked their body with all kinds of sores and all kinds of, um, uh, all, all kinds of, you know, convulsions. Uh, and eventually these people died sometimes after amputations, a very, very, uh, unpleasant death. So that's where we were. I, I just want to see, are there any questions about where we've been or thoughts that you've had about, uh, this altarpiece since our last, uh, get together. Okay, well then at the base of the altar, or excuse me, at the base of the cross here, here you have Mary and you have John who is the evangelist, John the evangelist to be distinguished from John the Baptist. Uh, it's understood that John the Evangelist also wrote the book of Revelation, but if you are in the Revelation Bible study, you know that not to be the case, right? Uh, this is a person referred to, in fact, I'll read the, the passage today, uh, who is caring for Mary, and then at the base of the cross, uh, Mary Magdalene. Her hair... Uh, <laughs> A little bit overdone, you would say. Uh, I can't imagine anybody in the Middle Ages wearing hair all the way down past their uh, past their waist. Uh, but all of this is to, you know, usually in Judaism, a woman was supposed to be modest to wear her hair back and wear her head covered. You know, Mary's head is covered here, but her hair is flowing down. Long hair was a symbol of. Uh, uh, being available, if you will. Uh, uh, prostitutes did not wear their hair back. Prostitutes wore their, you know, their hair down, uh, so they were more attractive to men. They're so-called temptresses, right? Um, and you will see down at the foot of the cross, uh, this alabaster vessel uh, that is associated with, with Mary of Magdalene. Now, what you're going to find out today is that everything you know about Mary of Magdalene is absolutely false or cannot be corroborated by historical evidence. Um, she has been misunderstood, I would even say maligned throughout history. And the question I wanna to ask to you is why has this taken place? Because a woman who um, is mentioned prior to the crucifixion in the gospels just once, and she's only met, she's mentioned 12 times uh, during or after the crucifixion, but prior to that time, we don't know anything about her. We only know that she's Mary of Magdala and she follows Jesus with other women, as we will, as we will see. 
But now already you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, isn't she the one who anoints Jesus' feet? Isn't she the one that, you know, is, is contemplating Jesus at his, at his feet, you know, while Martha is in the kitchen and, and all of these uh, stories that we, we believe that we know, uh, they're just, they're wrong. <laughs> they're just wrong. And a lot of this has to do with the way that Mary Magdalene has been portrayed in popular culture. Um, she is, well, you might have seen in Jesus Christ Superstar, right? Back, I remember I was just a, a young lad at the time when this came out, but that was, that was an amazing uh, musical. And they would play this music on the radio, you know, uh, I don't know how to love him. Uh, all of these songs that clearly made a connection between Mary having a very erotic uh, desires uh, for Jesus. You know, we can't find that in scripture. On the other end of the spectrum, we have stories about Jesus having erotic desires for Mary, the last temptation of the Christ by uh, Nikos Kazantzakis. You might know the novel or you might know, <clears throat> excuse me, you might know the film. But the film features uh, is basically, and maybe you can help me out with this. There was a story written by Stephen Crane, an incident at something bridge. I can't remember the name of the bridge, but Kazan Sakas basically uses the same type of um, schema that in the moment before Jesus dies, he has a flashback or a, a vision. And it's a temptation that he should come down off the cross spend the rest of his life with Mary Magdalene, whom he loves, raising children with her. Mary Magdalene dies. He later marries Mary of Bethany. And by the end of the film, you see that, um, you see that uh, this, is, this is all uh, just a vision that he has in the split second before he dies, right? It's kind of like this, I think it's a Stephen Crane story about a guy who's being hung on the bridge and just before he dies, he has this uh, American author, he has this uh, the fantasy that he escapes and it takes place during the Civil War. Uh, the same kind of thing happening in The Last Temptation of the Christ. Um, the, uh, the, but the whole point here is that there is this common understanding that there was something going on between Jesus and this woman of ill repute, right? This woman who, um, who, who loves this man who sees her for what she is and, and nevertheless uh, accepts her and offers, offers grace. And there, there are even uh, people who think that, you know, maybe they're, in fact, uh, this has been recent uh, in, in the gospel of Mary and the, the stories that are going on with um, some of the so-called Gnostic gospels that it's believed that Jesus and Mary were husband and wife, or they were at least um, in, involved with each other. Uh, this is the, the theme of the Da Vinci Code, that, uh, that Mary and, and, and Jesus were at lovers, if not married, and that at uh, Jesus' crucifixion, uh, Mary leaves uh, Judea. She's pregnant with uh, Jesus' child, she finds herself, and I'll talk about this in, in this legend, because this is what Da Vinci Code is picking up on. She finds herself in um, the south of France, uh, where she uh, gives birth to Jesus' child, a, a young girl named Sarah. And, um, and, and thus, you have the beginning of the so-called Merovingian line, which is the so-called Holy Grail. You know, to, the Merovingians saw themselves as descendants of Christ himself uh, through Mary Magdalene. So a lot, of, a lot of fun stuff happening there. Absolutely none of it is historically accurate or even biblically accurate. So let me, let me stop and see if there are some comments that people would like to make about, um, I don't know, maybe your impressions uh, of Mary Magdalene, what your thoughts have been about her in the past or impressions Anybody? <clears throat> oh, damn. I, th I think the title of that story is The Incident at Owl Creek Bridge. What Creek Bridge? Alum? Owl Creek, I think. I, I, um, once, once we're done here, I'll hop onto Google and, and look it up. Oh, okay. Well, I, now, on, on this device, I can't 
multitask. If, if no, I do that, I'll, I'll lose my connection. So anyway, I think that's right, but I've always wondered if that's where Katzen Sock has got the idea for this, <clears throat> because, you know, in the split second, when, when the guy is about to be hanged and, you know, he's got the rope around his neck and they, they throw him off the bridge, he has this image or this vision of him, of the rope breaking and him falling into the water and then getting away and, and starting a whole new life. And then by the end of the story, you realize it's just a split fantasy, a split second fantasy that he has. And he, in the last paragraph of the story, he <laughs> basically gets hanged by the neck. Um, I, think, I think it's an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Oh, oh an occurrence. That's yeah. right. Yes. It's the only sure. book that I remember reading from my sophomore year of high school. Right, right. <laughs> um, well, but one of the things, speaking of Mary, though, Dan, um, yes. one of the things that this sort of makes me think of is how much we read into scripture yes. and, and how much we maybe add ourselves to or our experiences to the narrative. Um, and Marilyn Salmon, who is my Newer Testament professor in seminary, talked a lot about like just what's the plain reading of the text? Like, mm -hmm. just start there. Like, what does the text actually say? Yeah. Um, and then, then you can go from there if you want. But um, let's just start at what's the what's the plain reading? What's the plain reading of the text? So. <clears throat> Well, in this case, the more interesting question for me after the plain reading, which is interesting enough, is why is it that we have developed as a church, as a tradition, this story around Mary Magdalene for over 2000 years and, it ex and accepted it as uh, a, this archetype that was just, you know, uh, believed without question. Uh, she is not a prostitute, as you we're going to find out. But there is legend that has built up around her. And one of these legends um, is from a, a book by called uh, The Golden Legend. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on your screen or not. <clears throat> but this is an elaborate story that really uh, Dan Brown, who wrote The Da Vinci Code, really picks up on this story. But the story goes that, that Mary was uh, in Judea after the death of Christ. Uh, and uh, eventually after several years, because of her preaching, her proclamation of the resurrection, she's, she's thrown out of Jerusalem and she's put on a boat, kind of this rudderless boat out to sea with you know, some of her, uh, her friends, I guess, um, some fellow Christians they're put on this rudderless boat out to sea in the Mediterranean, and there they float for a while, and they're brought up onto the shore of uh, what we now know today as, as southern France. And there they take refuge in a pagan shrine. And while they're at this shrine, there's this local governor or you know, leader who comes by, and he's going to pray for he, he and his wife want to have a child. And they've been unsuccessful at having a child. And Mary Magdalene, of course, preaches Christ, uh, preaches and proclaims Jesus to this man. And lo and behold, the, the man's wife becomes pregnant. And so the governor says, boy, this, this religion is really interesting. I want to find out more about it. And, and Mary says, well, you should talk to St. Peter, who's in, or you know, she didn't say St. Peter, but you should talk to Peter, who's in Rome. So the guy gets on a boat with his wife, and while they're on the boat, his wife dies in premature childbirth. And so they place her on, uh, I believe it's an island. And there he puts her down and the child is still living. He places the child on the woman's chest and says, well, you know, I gotta get going. I really wanna go see Peter, you know? Uh, so dead woman, child still suckering, suckling at the dead woman's uh, uh, breast man leaves, goes to Rome, meets Peter. Peter takes him to Jerusalem, tells him everything you, know, you ever wanna know about Jesus. On the way back, he says, you know, I think this is the island where I left my wife's body. Do you mind if we just stop by and you know, maybe I can bury her? 
Well, they come onto the shore and out runs this little two-year-old boy because he's been gone for two years. And uh, it so happens that this two-year-old boy has stayed alive by suckling at his mother's breast for two years. And lo and behold, the woman is resurrected and she tells the story, oh, hey, you went to Rome while I was dead. Thank you very much for leaving me here, you know, on the shore. But Mary Magdalene and I, we were with you the whole time. It's kind of like a, you know, a Christmas story where Scrooge is visited by the, the ghosts of Christmas past and present. So we were walking along with you and we heard everything about it, you know. So these the story develops that Mary in her, you know, in her um, excommunication, you might say, from the Jewish synagogues in Judea, goes and starts the church in France. And there are other tales about her that, that develop. And one of the probably the most famous is the, um, the tale, if you can look at the image here, of, of the egg. Do you know the story about the Easter egg? and why we do Easter eggs, apart from being a pagan symbol of fertility. Uh, but apparently, Mary was pretty miffed about uh, Jesus being crucified, so she hightails it up to Rome and demands a meeting with uh, Tiberius Caesar uh, and goes in and says, this was a man who was absolutely innocent. You, you should not have crucified him. In fact, he was the son of God and he was resurrected. And and for some reason, she has this egg that she brings along. It's a white egg. And she's trying to explain the resurrection to Tiberius with this white egg. And Tiberius says, a man has, is no more likely of being resurrected than that white egg is of turning red. And then all of us, or, or of a chicken laying a red egg. And Mary takes the egg and it shows, shows it to him. And lo and behold, it's a red egg. You know, uh, I don't know that it really converted Tiberius at all. But, but there are all these magnificent, you know, grandiose stories that, that go around Mary Magdalene. But it's kind of interesting because she's really, she really doesn't play a central role in the gospels until the crucifixion and after the crucifixion. She's not mentioned in any of Paul's letters. She's not mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. She's not mentioned in any of the other letters that are written in the New Testament. She's not mentioned by the early church fathers. In the Gospels, where she is mentioned, there are only 13 references. And only one of those is a reference made to her prior to the crucifixion. Now, she is present with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and other women at the crucifixion. And that's attested in all of the Gospels. But prior to this time, this is what we have about Mary Magdalene. They're this is in Luke. And Luke is talking about Jesus and who is with him uh, while he is traveling through Galilee. Uh, the 12 were with him, the 12 apostles, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called the Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Sus Susanna, and many others who provided for them. Rich, a very rich text right here. Um, if you want to talk about the plain meaning of the text, um, first of all, there are in Jesus' entourage, you might say, not just men, but women who appear to be fairly uh, powerful, right? You've got the wife of Herod's steward, Herod, the king of Herod Antipas, we assume. Herod Antipas, the, uh, you know, the tetrarch of Galilee. The steward is the guy who, you know, takes care of the house, right? He's, he's the one, you know, checking off all of the, uh, the, the credits and debits. That's a pretty powerful position. And here you have the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, a, a, another a, a Jewish woman, and many others who, the, the Greek word is literally ministered to them, but the word can mean basically bankrolled them, right? Uh, provided money for them, 
these guys have to eat someplace. You know, Jesus and his disciples or and his apostles, they don't have a lot of time to, you know, do a lot of fishing or carpentry. <laughs> they're, they're going around proclaiming the gospel and the, 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 the apocalyptic uh, end of the world, you know, if we understand Jesus to be an apocalyptic prophet, as, as many do. And so in Jesus' group, uh, there seems to be almost an outer circle of women, one of whom was Mary. And she's referred to as the Magdalene because Magdala was a place, uh, was a town in Galilee, uh, fairly wealthy with, you know, compared to Nazareth uh, because it was associated with the fishing trade on uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and of course, the Romans had complete control over the fishing trade, but there were some who were some Jews who were making uh, money. Now, we know that uh, Herod's wife, or excuse me, the steward of Herod, Herod's steward's wife uh, is present here. We don't know if Mary was married. It doesn't say that she was a prostitute here. All we know is that she was from Magdala. And she was one from whom seven demons had gone out. Now note, it does not say that Jesus cast out those demons, right? She's just one from whom seven demons had gone out, okay? Now, remember, this idea of seven demons is going to play a role in the later history of the church, because you might remember, if you've read your Canterbury Tales, that there are seven and and prior to that, there are seven deadly sins. So here's a place, a text, the plain text where people, as, as Damon says, are going to read into it. Ah, oh, this is Mary from whom seven demons had gone out. She must have fallen victim in the past to the seven deadly sins. Um, this is all we have uh, about Mary prior to the crucifixion. Uh, so how do we come to this place uh, where we recognize her almost immediately as a prostitute who loved Jesus and who, uh, who converted, uh, turned around, metanoia, completely uh, changed her ways and became utterly devoted to Christ. Um, well, it's by a series of mistakes that can be very clearly lined out, and I'm going to try to do it for you here. So any, any questions so far? I'll make sure that I've got all of my references in place. Oh, Dan, this is not a question. It's, it's just kind of a, um, a sarcastic observation. And that is that in that one legend, Mary is punished by being sent on a Mediterranean cruise and ending up <clears throat> in the south of France. Right. <laughs> That's a punishment. I love it. <laughs> yeah, on a rudderless ship, which is not unlike the Carnival Cruise Lines these days. Absolutely. I, I'm hearing. <laughs> uh, so, boy, maybe that was prophetic, what was going on. Well, let, let's look at some of these stories where women are involved uh, with Jesus and, and see where they uh, come into the equation. So Jesus spends a lot of time in Bethany, and, and I should point out here that one of the problems that we have uh, with this is that Mary is a very, very common name. In fact, some people have suggested that as many as 20% of the women in, in Judea and uh, Galilee at the time were named Mary. It's a, it's a derivative of Miriam, uh, who was the, uh, the sister of Moses. And you might know of Miriam's, uh, uh, the song of Miriam that's sung after the uh, uh, Israelites are freed from Egypt. So Miriam has a very, very, you know, uh, important role, at least in the history and the psyche of, of the, uh, the Jewish people. So it's not uncommon for people to, you know, uh, give, give credence to that or to, to recognize that role by, you know, naming their child Mary. And so there are a lot of Marys. So here we are in chapter 14, and Jesus is in Bethany, also the home of another Mary, Mary of Bethany. And while he was at Bethany, I'm reading from 14, 3 through 9, Mark. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, 
As he sat at the table, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her and Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me for you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could she has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Now, it doesn't say Mary Magdalene, but there is a connection here um, with what Mary Magdalene later does, right? Because Mary Magdalene is going to be the woman who is going to go to Jesus while Jesus is in the tomb and anoint his body during the burial. And it says here, but you will, uh, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand uh, uh, for, for its burial. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. So connection, boom. Oh, well, Mary is the one who anointed his body at the burial. This must be the woman that we're talking about. Now, it, it doesn't say that this woman is a prostitute, right? Very costly. She's just a woman with came in with alabaster jar of costly ointment of nard. She broke it open. Well, this is, I'm going to show you how all these things get, you know, can clump together. But here is another image of Mary. Whenever you see Mary, Mary Magdalene, you always often see her with that, you know, that costly, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that costly jar of, of alabaster ointment, the alabaster jar of ointment, and, it, and as in the Eisenheim altar piece, this is almost like her totem, right? You can, you, you know her by uh, not only her long hair and her devotion to Christ, but also this ointment uh, of costly nard. Um, well, that's, that's one of the, the stories. Now, there's another story in John chapter 12 of Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany is a different person altogether, but there is a story that is told about her uh, anointing Jesus and one that comes uh, very close to what we're talking about here. So six days before the Passover, I'm reading John, the Gospel of John chapter 12, one through eight. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, people will also think, well, yeah, Mary is the one. He, she had a brother named Lazarus. No, no, different Mary. <laughs> different. This is Mary of Bethany here. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. Thus, the long flowing hair we see here. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold uh, for 300 denarii, the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept a common purse and used to steal when, it was put, when something was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She's, she bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now the story that was told in Mark is associated with a different Mary, Mary of Bethany. But because the story of Mark may have already been associated with Mary of Magdalene, now Mary of Bethany becomes Mary of Magdalene as well. Okay, now in Luke, <laughs> and I'm going through this rather quickly. This is where things get really uh, kind of dicey. Uh, in Luke chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, I will just read this, these two verses here. Um, I'll just make sure I'm in the right place here. Uh, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner 
having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she's a sinner. And Jesus spoke up and says, hey, you know, you're just as much of a sinner as she is, right? Well, here we have the same story, same alabaster uh, uh, jar, does not say it's Mary, but it does say it's a sinner, okay? So we have the woman with the alabaster jar who would, who in Mark anoints Jesus for his burial. That woman gets connected with Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany then is confused with Mary Magdalene. And now a sinner gets added to the equation. Sinner does not mean prostitute. If you're a Pharisee, just about everybody's a sinner. This could be a woman who, you know, worked on Sunday. This could be a woman who, uh, you know, didn't, didn't eat kosher when it was necessary. Nothing about a prostitute. There's nothing here about a prostitute. So, uh, and then of course, the adulteress that is brought out in, you might know the story in John chapter eight, where they find a woman who's a sinner and they're going to stone her. And Jesus says, let he who is sinless throw the first stone. All of these stories get wrapped up in a nice little package and thrown in the direction of Mary Magdalene. There's no connection. If we read the plain text, as da uh, Damon says, there's no connection there whatsoever. So the result is jo Jesus anointed by Mary Magdalene, who is a prostitute. And that is the image that we continue to have of, of Mary Magdalene. Now, she doesn't get any favors made for her when uh, no less a person than Pope Gregory in 591 <clears throat> is giving a little homily. And he brings all this stuff together in a nice, nice neat little package. She, whom Luke, Luke calls the sinful woman, as we just read, whom John calls Mary, as we just read, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected, according to Mark. And what did these seven devils signify, if not all the vices? It is clear, brothers, that the woman previously used the unguent to perf perf perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. What she therefore displayed more scandalously, she was now offering to God in a more praiseworthy manner. She turned the mass of her crimes to virtues in order to serve God entirely in penance for as much as she had wrongly held God in contempt. So now Pope Gregory uh, declares that Mary Magdalene is the patron saint of, of, of lost sinners, of completely lost sinners, those who uh, are at the bottom of the barrel but can be converted and turned around, you know, uh, by the presence of Christ. And here, of course, uh, Mary on the, uh, she, she does become a patron saint, the patron saint of women, which, which is really pretty interesting, isn't it, right? Um, all women, Mary Magdalene is the patron saint of uh, and this woman, who is the patron saint, has been wrongly identified <laughs> as a prostitute. So if I were a woman, I wouldn't be too crazy about that association. She's also the patron saint of contemplatives, uh, the patron saint of hairdressers, interestingly enough, but the patron saint of perfumers, and the, uh, did I say contemplatives as well, because she's one who contemplates Christ on uh, the cross. So I'm, I'm putting a lot of stuff into a lot of in a short amount of time. Let me stop and see if there are any questions about Pope Gregory, about the, the pre-crucifixion text that I just read. Well, then let's talk about what the Gospels do affirm and what Grunewald uh, it gets historically accurate to some extent in his crucifixion. 
Jesus was uh, present, excuse me, Mary Magdalene was present at the crucifixion. And if you give me a second, I will read that uh, text for you. Um, and it's, a, it's important to remember because it does give us the text that Grunewald is referring to here. I'm reading from chapter 9, 19, 25 uh, through 27. Um, now that's, that's not what I need. Meanwhile, standing near the cross uh, of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas. So Mary has a sister named Mary. Well, that means her sister-in-law, right? Mary, Mary, Virgin Mary is there, mother of Jesus, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, that's the two on the left, right? He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. The story of the beloved disciples we'll talk about in two weeks, uh, being the caretaker for uh, Mary, uh, the mother of, of Jesus. But then the, the story that we know probably better is the story of uh, Mary, as told in all of the gospels, going to the tomb on the morning of uh, Sunday after the Sabbath to anoint the body of Jesus. And just let me read that here for us. Um, John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And this is where we get the word maudlin from, right? The Magdalene, maudlin, the weeper. Uh, Jesus has been crucified in John. The disciples or the apostles are hiding for fear of the Jews, as the text says. Uh, and Mary, faithful Mary, goes to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what she had seen. And, uh, and she had told them the things that she had seen and the things that he said to her. So uh, here we have faithful Mary coming to anoint the body, finding the tomb empty. And interestingly enough, the story says this tomb is in the midst of a garden. And when Jesus speaks to her, he, she confuses him for the gardener, which is a really, really interesting theological point. Because if we know that creation begins in a garden and creation uh, is fallen due to the act of one in the garden, uh, this almost creates a situation where Jesus is the second Adam, the new gardener of creation, right? She wasn't mistaken. He was the gardener. And I think that's what John is trying to get across here. But Jesus says, uh, don't hold on to me. I, I need to ascend to my father. But what I want you to do is I want you to go and tell the apostles that I've risen. And in other texts, he tells Mary to say, and tell them to meet me in Galilee, or I'm going to be here at such and such a time, uh, you know, all of these resurrection appearances. So in many ways, Mary Magdalene is referred to as, is given the uh, distinction of being the apostle to the apostles. Apostle means one who is sent. 
she is the first Christian apostle, after post-resurrection apostle. She is the one given authority to proclaim the risen Christ, which people need to remember, even in the 21st century, if the, as they say that women have no authority to preach from the pulpit. Well, Jesus himself uh, first chose a woman to go and tell a bunch of cowering to, to apostles that they, uh, you know, that they could expect him. Um, I love this image of Jesus. And there are so many images that this is, I call this a uh, halfback Jesus, you know, it's just <laughs> almost like he's running to the, the goal line and, and Mary wants to touch him and he's kind of sidelining her, you know, wait, 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 don't touch me. Uh, don't touch me, I need to ascend it. Don't hold on to me. Uh, this is Titian in 1512, about the same time that the Grunewald, almost exactly the same time the Grunewald uh, crucifixion is being painted. Uh, but the Latin is noli me tangere, don't touch me. Uh, the Greek literally means don't hold on to me, uh, which, which is much richer in meaning, right? Don't try to keep me present. I must ascend to my God and your God, to my father and to your father. Yeah, don't, don't hold fast to the, the, the man that I used to be. I now am glorified, as, as John says. Um, but some concluding thoughts here. <clears throat> there, this is not the last time we hear of Mary Magdalene. In fact, there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of re recent interest in the so-called gospel of Mary. Uh, in the third and fourth century, there are a number of gospels written called Gnostic gospels. And uh, most Gnostic gospels hold to the idea that uh, salvation comes through a, a special secret knowledge that, that Jesus can give to, um, to his followers. And the gospel of Mary is, is one of those. Uh, now it was, it, there was a number of gospels found at Nag Hammadi in Egypt in 1945, and we know a lot about the Gnostic gospels, but interestingly, the gospel of Mary uh, was discovered in the 19th century prior to this, so it's been around, uh, but it's here that we get the sense that Mary and Jesus have a connection that is not unlike the connection of uh, Adam and Eve in, in the garden, when, when Adam knows his wife, that has a, a double meaning. Adam, uh, you know, has, has intercourse with her. Adam takes her into his, his bedroom, so to speak. But he also knows her intimately. They, the two become one, right? And it's such a nice uh, way of looking at um, uh, the, you know, the sex act, which is often given uh, often disparaged in our culture, right? Uh, but in the Gospel of Mary, it's, it's this intimacy between Jesus and Mary that certainly has erotic uh, overtones as well. And Mary is seen as the prime apostle, right? As the number one apostle who is teaching from her secret knowledge. But the question that I'd like to ask, and, and hopefully we can have some discussion about this is why, why this archetype? Why this need to impose upon uh, a woman who, who very innocently appears just in a few verses in the Gospel of Luke and then later at the crucifixion, why this need to cling all of these, uh, to attribute all of these less than admirable qualities to her almost like Velcro, boom, you know. She's a sinner, she's a prostitute, she's given away this. And uh, what, what purpose does this serve in the Christian tradition? And I, I really, I have a hard time understanding this, uh, um, but it has happened and it is, it is main, it's maintained its course throughout history. If you ask anybody in our congregation, they will tell you quite categorically, yeah, she was a prostitute, right? No, no. Uh, probably helped along by the, the painters. This is a female painter, by the way, Artemisia Gentileschi. We were talking about her with Turner 
not long ago. But this is a really interesting, she actually stole this from Caravaggio, but it's still an interesting piece from a woman, Mary Magdalene in ecstasy. Um, you kind of wonder what kind of ecstasy we're talking about here. Is this an erotic ecstasy or is this a spiritual ecstasy? Or is there a difference between the two, right? By this time, when Jedaleski is, is, is uh, painting, there have been many female uh, mystics, people like Julian of Norwich and uh, Hildegard of Bingen and uh, Mechtild of Magdeburg, if you can remember that name, uh, who, who talk about this union with Christ in very, very erotic terms. It's this mystical union and prayer that they become one with Christ, the way Mary Magdalene uh, is reputed to have done, at least in the Gospel of Mary. But we don't really see that nuance to Mary of Mary Magdala. Of Magdala. Uh, we see her as the complete opposite of what a good follower of Christ should be until she gives it all over to Jesus. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts about this? I, you know, I, we, I've got two representatives of the, uh, the female uh, uh, gender here. And so <laughs> any, any thoughts on this? Or Will, you can okay, represent. Okay, and I'll jump in since okay. I'm gonna, it's just the two of us. So, you know, we've got to yeah. do something here. <laughs> There's part of me that just thinks that there is, a an ongoing through line of just misogyny that was cultural and you know everything is seen through that cultural misogyny um, yeah. even even the story of christ perhaps yeah. too simplistic no 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 not at all in fact uh and i wouldn't there's certainly that misogyny in the jewish uh culture and some of the stories uh in, in fact, one of the things I would like to propose here is that uh, maybe Mary Magdalene serves the purpose of being the redeemed Eve, right? Eve was the, well, you, you know the story, the, 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 the world's oldest profession, right? She, she has been deemed the prostitute who tempted Adam to eat the, the fruit from the tree of knowledge, good and evil. Uh, and thus brought all of creation down. And since that time, you know, um, the, the woman has been the temptress. There, there's another great story in Judaism, uh, the story of Lilith. Do you know about Lilith? Have you heard about Lilith? There's a Jewish tradition that says that the first uh, wife, the first mate of Adam was made as Adam's equal, male and female, he created them, right? And her name was Lilith. But because she just was wreaking havoc throughout all of creation, finally, Adam came to God and said, hey, look, this, this woman you gave me, I can't control her. She's just way too much. And so Lilith is condemned, she's excommunicated from creation. She's, she's sent out on the, the border of, of, uh, of paradise itself. And there she becomes the archetype for the witch, you know, the, the witch who's always after, uh, you know, uh, children to kill them. In fact, in the, in the Jewish tradition, uh, when a, a child is born, they are given a little amulet to protect them against Lilith, right? Well, the story goes that after Lilith, God said, boy, yeah, I really, I really made a mistake on that one, Adam. Uh, don't know what to do, but let's try this. Go to sleep. I'm going to take a rib and I'm going to create a woman out of you who obviously have been, you know, very, very faithful to me. Um, and and that, should do, that should do quite well, don't you think? And so Adam goes to sleep. A rib is taken from him and, and Eve is created. But don't you know it? Eve messes up too. That serpent in the garden, she's always, you know, and, and there's, there's something of a kind of an erotic 
aspect to the conversation between Eve. There, it's almost a flirting that's going on, right? Oh, really? Did God really say that? Now, come on, you know. Um, but nevertheless, it's Eve is the one who is blamed for <clears throat> uh, the fall of creation. So I'm, I'm wondering if Mary Magdalene, whether we know this, whether it's done purposely or not, serves the role of the archetype of fallen Eve <clears throat> who is redeemed. Even though Mary Magdalene historically was not a prostitute, we need to impute to her or impose upon her this image that has carried through all of Jewish history in order to assure ourselves in some way that not just women, but creation itself is redeemed. Mary Magdalene is redeemed Eve in that respect. Nevertheless, um, not fair. And I can just see you ready to say something here. Yes. <laughs> um, and kind of following along and, and then um, taking a, a little swerve from what Lynn said, I think in, in this misogynistic context then, um, the figure of Mary Magdalene as somebody who did all the sins and who was, you know, so awful, even she can be redeemed. And so she becomes a very hopeful figure right. for, for, for Christianity. And the other thing I was going to say is, I'm thinking I remember um, a tour of um, kind of edgy women rock bands in the 90s called the Lilith Tour. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, Lilith Fair. Yeah, yeah that's still going on. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, they didn't happen, uh, but it, it would be all women bands and that would show up and, you know, uh, the Dixie Chicks were big and who now changed their, their name to uh, just the Chicks. They're just that's the Chicks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it's much better, uh, but but right, uh, Lilith Fair was, uh, you know, uh, kind of a tip of the hat, a, a nod to the, the idea of Lilith. Um, but right, yes, the, uh, the, the almost hopeless, hopelessly lost sinner can still be redeemed. But, mm -hmm. but uh, in, in concluding, thinking about Mary Magdalene at Lent, there is an aspect of Mary Magdalene that uh, uh, that doesn't often get emphasized, and that is the f one who is faithful to Christ at the time of his death, the crucifixion, while uh, disciples are hiding for fear of you know the Romans and the Jews. Uh, she has the fortitude to be to go to the tomb uh, and anoint the body of Christ, to, to contemplate. She's the one who contemplates Christ at the cross. If you look at some of the art of the Renaissance, Mary is always the one at the foot of the cross. I wonder, uh, so, so for us in, in Lent, a, a time of contemplation, of introspection is, is so important. Um, whether Mary Magdalene is the patron saint of women, she can also be the patron saint. She is also the patron saint of contemplatives just want to leave you with two images. Uh, this, the image on the right now, I can't remember who did this, but here's Mary. It, this is obviously Baroque with all of the, you know, uh, finery on the, on the, the woman's dress. Mary's usually dressed in red on the right. She's got her alabaster jar, but Delacroix, uh, the person who, who painted Lady Liber Liberty leading the troops during the French Revolution, also has this image, <laughs> just like, what are you thinking, uh, Delacroix? I mean, you know, it's Mary contemplating Jesus at the cross, but here she is dressed in red. She's still obviously the prostitute with her breast bared, right? right? Uh, born, I guess is the right word. No, bearing her breast at the cross. But when I, I saw this, I thought, what is the connection here? I mean, Delacroix, painting Lady Liberty, leading the troops, also with a bare breast, if you know the, 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 uh, the painting, and then completely unnecessary, unless, unless somebody is so 
ignorant that they don't know who Mary Magdalene is by the 19th century, right? Uh, but I, I just found this almost offensive, you know, uh, just the red and the, 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 the breast being born and, and Christ uh, on the cross. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to, to hear another uh, perspective on that. But uh, looking at Mary in the art of the 20th century, Western art is fascinating. And I wish we could just do a whole three or four weeks just on that because uh, uh, we've crammed a lot into about 45 minutes here. So, but that being the case, it's almost time. Damon has left us, so I am going to uh, sign off. Is there anything anyone would like to say? Will is out of here already. Thank okay, you. Okay, one thing. Always interesting. Go, go okay. ahead, yeah. Anne. Thank you. No, I was going to ask, okay, when was it that those topless dresses were in fashion? <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. <laughs> and is Dela, I mean, is, is that when Dela, Delacroix was painting? Yeah, was, I mean, I, I can't remember. Well, it was French. It was French in the end of the 19th century, you know, or excuse me, uh, the beginning. Yeah, the beginning yeah. of the 19th yeah. century. You know, those little, but you, you see the same yeah. thing. You see the same thing in Germany, you know, like the St. Pauli girl, uh, uh, German uh, waitress bringing beer out with her low cut, you know, low cut dress. Um, yeah, wear, wearing but, the ultimate push up bra. Yeah. <laughs> yes. right. uh, Nobody course, naturally looks like that. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the, uh, the, the alternative sin would be the men wearing later hosen. So well, <laughs> take one or the other. Yeah. So on that a very felicitous note, I'm going to leave us and uh, I'll see you next week. Well, we'll look at Mary of, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who also has very interesting history as well. So, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.